All right, the session is now being recorded and I am going to share the presentation deck. All right, we are all set up. Welcome. It is 1035, thanks for your patience. Uh, we've got about 100 people on the call now and that's fantastic. So my name is Kiri Bird. I am a consultant overseeing the Vancouver Foundation Investment Readiness Program and thanks for joining today for the information session. So Vancouver Foundation is a regional partner with Community Foundations of Canada, overseeing the Investment Readiness Program, which is an initiative funded by the Government of Canada. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that Vancouver Foundation is situated on the traditional unceded and territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. Roadmap for our session today, we're going to start with some introductions, talk about the landscape of opportunity for social finance in Canada at this time. We'll talk, of course, about the Investment Readiness Program, uh, and I'll provide some resources to support you with your applications. We are going to save the majority of the time today for questions and discussions, about 45 minutes. So briefly, I'm sure many of you will know the Vancouver Foundation, but we are a community foundation established in 1943. Our vision is to build a healthy, vibrant, and livable community across British Columbia. We're a provincial foundation. In 2018, we granted out $60 million. We make grants to qualified donees with a registered charitable number. And if you're thinking, well, I signed up for this session, I'm a co-op, I'm a for-profit social enterprise, don't worry, we'll talk about that. Through the IRP program, we are going to be able to provide grants to non-qualified donees or non-repayable capital. Other granting areas at the foundation include our systems change grants, youth engagement and racial equity grants through the level program, as well as neighborhood small grants and more. So you can always find more information about Vancouver Foundation on our website. Please feel free to visit as well as I would strongly encourage sign up for the Investment Readiness Program um, newsletter, which has just been launched and the first issue went out today. So if you are a non-qualified donee, so that is a uh, non-for-profit, a for-profit social enterprise, a hybrid organization like a community contribution company, for example, um, we will be able to, through our consortium partners, provide non-repayable capital through this program. And so I would like to acknowledge our consortium partners, Van City Community Foundation and UBC Solder, um, and those would be um, the entities through which you might be receiving the non-repayable capital if you are successful in this program. We can't talk about the investment readiness program without talking about social finance. So um, briefly, the investment readiness program helps to um, so, uh, get social purpose organizations access to Canada's growing social finance marketplace. At the highest level, social finance is repayable investment that generates a positive social, environmental, and or cultural impact. So the important words here are repayable and impact. Um, in the 2018 fall economic statement, the, the government of Canada announced a $755 million social finance fund. And it's important to note that this money will be matched by the private sector, representing in total about a $2 billion opportunity. This is really gonna catalyze um, a, a bunch of new investment, a bunch of opportunity for social enterprise and enterprising social purpose organizations in Canada, as we expect the cost of this capital to be available below market rate. Just gonna pause for one second, and because I'm getting some notes about people not being able to hear. Are there any issues with hearing my voice? You can write into the chat. Okay, good, it says the sound is back up. Great, thank you so much. A little bit more about social finance and its potential uses and, and the forms it can take. So 
uh, can take the form of loans, you know, where an investor gets their money back plus interest or equity investments, where the investor becomes a part owner in that organization. I did want to touch briefly on other forms of social finance, which might be a little less familiar. So some of those include community bonds, where many people loan small amounts to one project. This has typically been used to purchase real estate assets in Canada, so that might be an opportunity for social finance. And another one is um, social impact bonds, or what are more recently being referred to as community-driven outcomes contracts. And in those cases, an investor is paid back, typically by the government, if the program achieves certain impact outcomes. So I've included a link to a recent article by Stephen Huddard from McConnell Foundation, the CEO, as well as Jeff Sear from Raven Indigenous Capital Partners. And um, th these slides, as I mentioned, will be available to everyone after the session, as well as um, the audio recording or the video recording from the webinar. So um, I encourage folks who might be thinking about impact bonds or community-driven outcomes contracts um, to review these articles and reach out to me directly if you'd like to have more of a conversation about how the IRP program can help you think about um, that form of social finance down the road. So the problem, um, so there's, you know, there is money available currently with impact investing and there will be much more money available soon. The problem is there's often a gap between the readiness of social purpose organizations to access social finance and the risk tolerance of impact investors. You know, um, a social enterprise doesn't have all their financials in order, doesn't have their legal in order, things like this. And the investment readiness program is intended to address this very specific gap. It's important to note that this program is part of a larger ecosystem of initiatives, or rather the Vancouver Foundation uh, part of it is a part of a larger ecosystem. So in addition to the $755 million social finance fund, the IRP is a $50 million fund to really prime the Canadian ecosystem of social purpose organizations to access this market. Uh, there's $50 million spread across a number of partners. I'll highlight them quickly and then get more specific. So readiness support partners who are providing non-repayable capital to social purpose organizations, as well as expert service providers who are providing services to those social purpose organizations, usually for uh, money. Um, as well as ecosystem mobilization initiatives wrapped around these two types of partners or actors in the ecosystem. And the mobilization initiatives might be working on things like um, impact measurement dashboards across the country or coordinating networks or tables of impact investors so that they're easier to, to pitch to and access for social purpose organizations. Just moving back up to the readiness support partners. So these are folks that social purpose organizations can get money from. Uh, there, are, there are five sort of large national partners, two are indigenous led, one is a Quebec based um, uh, network, um, one is women led and working on gender equity issues, and then the fifth is Community Foundations of Canada, who received the bulk, uh, you know, 20 odd million of that 50 million and have distributed it through regional partners such as Vancouver Foundation across the country. I highlighted the Canadian Women's Foundation in addition to regional partners, for example, Vancouver Foundation for this group, because if you are based in BC and um, you have uh, gender, your, your organization is working on gender equity issues, it's probably worth also looking into the um, Canadian Women Foundation's call, which opens uh, at the end of February, their second call. So do, do look into that. And if you are part of a friendship center, you know, contact your, the friendship center's community. Um, and same thing if you um, are an Aboriginal uh, financial institution, you should also be working with uh, NACA, the National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association. All of the partners, including service providers and ecosystem mobilization initiatives are visible on the Employment and Social Development Canada website. You will have access to these links after the webinar today. So um, I will share the information and we'll talk a little bit more about expert service providers in a minute. 
So if you're thinking, thanks for all the background information, but I'm just looking for money for my social purpose organization in BC. There are five IRP partners in BC that you can reach out to. Um, and so you should be looking to the regional partner, which is overseeing your geography. So it's a, uh, it was a population based formula that was used to disperse these funds. That means that folks within those regions have specific funds for folks in those regions. And so we have the Vancouver Foundation IRP, the Vancouver Island IRP, the Okanagan IRP, the Fraser Valley IRP, and the Northern BC and Caribou Regional IRP. Uh, Vancouver Foundation is going to be serving <laughs> um, the Metro Vancouver region and all other areas in BC not covered by one of these regional partners. So that's um, the Sunshine Coast, Whistler, Squamish area, up the coast, as well as parts of the interior, such as the Kootenays, as you can imagine. If you are unsure about which region you should be reaching out to, um, the list of regional partners as well as the specific contact people or liaisons for each is available on the Community Foundations of Canada website. Again, you'll get this, these links after the webinar today. Gulf Islands are covered by, I want to say, Vancouver Foundation. So the Vancouver Foundation IRP is um, a $1.8 million program. So we have $1.8 million in non-repayable capital to deploy by March 2021. 50% of that capital is expected to be deployed in this first round, which opened today and has a deadline of February 10th to apply. Um, you do apply actually through the Community of Foundations online portal, not through the uh, Vancouver Foundation. So this link is active. I checked it today. My colleagues from CFC can confirm. And uh, we do expect the first round of applicants will receive the results by the end of April and with at least one more round before March 2021. So what does the IRP fund? Uh, social purpose organizations can apply for amounts ranging from $10,000 to $100,000. The IRP goal is to help social enterprises move towards becoming investment ready. So these examples provided by Lowe are, are, are just exemplary. You can, there's a quite a real range of things that you can apply for, but exploring a new business idea or developing a business plan to test the feasibility, creating a marketing plan to reach new audiences and increase your revenue, planning new products or services to grow revenue, preparing the documentation needed to approach potential investors as you move towards taking on capital. So the funds are not eligible for core operating costs. Funds are intended to be used to access outside expert service or advice or create dedicated staff capacity. So, um, you know, this isn't money for your CEO to cover ongoing costs. This is not money for rent. Um, you know, we do expect that this money is being deployed towards a specific project that's going to help move you along the investment readiness continuum. And we'll talk about the continuum a little bit more in a minute. As you would have seen on the website, you can apply to the IRP if you are a charity, a nonprofit, a co-op, a for-profit social enterprise, or a hybrid entity such as a community contribution company. This is really wonderful that this program is open to such a broad range of social impact organizations. Um, do note that non-qualified donees will access their capital through ultimately our consortium partners and you would receive your money directly from Vancouver Foundation if you are indeed a charity. So applicants must have a plan to operate a mechanism um, that generates revenue from the sale of goods or services. So you don't actually have to be already generating revenue, but you must have a plan to generate revenue. Uh, you must have a charitable number or a business registration number. I think one important point for clarification is that sole proprietorships are not eligible for IRP funding, which gives us some indication and some, um, yeah, some information about readiness because you do have to be incorporated and you have to demonstrate in the application of the plan, capacity and the expertise to carry out the proposed project for which you're applying. It's probably worth spending a few moments on the definition of social enterprise or rather a for-profit social enterprise. 
So we consider and CFC considers the social enterprise to extend beyond the corporate social responsibility model um, or the contribution of some profit to a social cause. So for example, when you sell a product and you plant a tree, the social enterprise really should have a integrated um, business model and mission and it's using business approach uh, and, and the sale of goods and services to pursue a positive impact. That impact can be social, cultural or environmental. It's non-prescriptive. So some factors that might distinguish uh, for-profit social enterprise include the impact objectives are embedded into the organization's core purpose, the operating model, the value chain, and the organizational culture are mission aligned. A reasonable percentage of profits are reinvested in the purpose. And I would even go so far to say a, you know, a significant percentage of profits are reinvested into purpose. The IRP aims to support social enterprises that are keen on expanding the impact of their social, environmental, and cultural mission, not maximize their profits. So if you are looking to expand you know, throughout the province because um, that will enable you to hire more people with barriers to employment, for example, um, not just to increase your bottom line. So the investment readiness continuum is mentioned in a lot of the literature, a lot of the program guidelines. Um, we we'll just spend some time looking at that here and give some direction as to um, how much money you should be applying for depending on where you are in the continuum. So we've got, um, let's call them five stages for the purpose of this webinar, early stage innovation, strategic impact focus, impact sustainability, financial resilience, or investment or investor ready. In that early stage innovation space, so you might be still exploring an idea, you, you understand a problem well, or maybe you're diving a bit deeper into that problem and you think you have a solution. This may be potentially early for the program. Um, it, it is eligible for funding, but there are other potential avenues you might want to go. So again, you know, it doesn't have to be an incorporated business. Um, and if you're still unsure about the solution you're proposing, I do want to recommend that um, potential applicants visit the Inuweave website because they are offering social finance courses, coaches, and workshops that will help to further develop ideas. The strategic impact focus area, um, we've got feasibility and analysis um, and community support development. So in terms of an organization at this stage, let's call it phase stage two, you might be looking into a specific target market, um, testing um, to ensure product market fit. You might be engaging with a particular community to get support for a project that's going to require a lot of stakeholder buy-in. These would be eligible costs under the IRP. We do recommend, um, as this would be still quite early stage, a little bit higher risk, applying for potentially a smaller amount. Under 30K is what we've seen from our, our consortium partners um, have provided us that evidence that that's sort of a good range to be thinking about. Um, ultimately, we want to, you know, distribute the $1.8 million at Vancouver Foundation as far as we can. We want to support both early stage and more mature projects. And so uh, we do really want to encourage people to be um, thoughtful and realistic in terms of what they're applying for um, so that we can, we can spread this money as far as possible because there's so many worthy organizations in, um, in the province and in our, our service area. Impact sustainability. So um, in this phase, you might be um, really honing in on your impact metrics. You might be looking at uh, diverse, more diversified revenue sources and um, financial modeling, for example, putting in place um, accounting systems or uh, te technology tools or processes to streamline um, your sustainability as an organization. You know, in this range, consider applying between $10,000 to $100,000. Similarly, in the financial resilience uh, phase, you might be at this point doing work on your legal structure um, or potentially on your ability to scale and replicate. And so in this stage, you might be thinking about um, investing in your um, like 
production capacity or warehouse facilities or um, doing a small renovation, a specific renovation to address a, um, a, a new demand, a new need. So that those are categories of things that might be in the financial resilience stage. And then finally, when you are, you know, quote unquote, investment investor ready, um, you probably have a sustainable cash flow and assets. Uh, you have track record for sustainability and networking with prospective investors. And it is still possible to apply in this stage if you need to, for example, do a very specific legal documentation process to take in new money or your investors have said do this one thing and then you know we'll we'll work with you that would be an appropriate application at the investment investor ready stage it would just be important to make that clear in the application um, and there is no reason you need to i had this question at another information session we did in vancouver uh, there is no reason you need to wait for the, the you know, the big federal social finance fund announcement, there are impact investors today who are looking for deal flow. So um, I would recommend, you can reach out to me for contact information, but um, I would recommend thinking about SVX, Social Venture Exchange, or New Market Funds locally in Vancouver is doing some work to coordinate impact investors. And so uh, there, are, there are sources of capital you can access currently if you are already at that stage, you don't need the IRP program. Just going to take one moment and unmute our friends at CFC because they would like to say something. I am having technical difficulties figuring out how to unmute my friends at CFC, which is unfortunate. It might be because I'm sharing my screen. Let me stop my share for one moment and see if that helps the process. Yes, it is, okay. Just bear with me one second. Hi, everybody. Hey, there we go. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> Hi, sorry. It turns out I can't unmute on my end if you have kind of the master controls. <laughs> um, sorry about that. I don't mean to interject. You're doing a wonderful job. Uh, my name is Michelle. I'm managing the kind of the IRP. Um, um, actually, so I just wanted to quickly say a couple of things. Um, you're doing a great job talking about the IRP. Um, I wanted to mention that I think the Gulf Islands might be part of our Vancouver, or sorry, our Vancouver Island Consortium. So I just would want to double check that quickly and I can get back to you. And the other thing was the idea of um, at the ideation stage, another possibility would be that you are an existing charitable organization and you have the idea to be a, a revenue stream. Um, so that's kind of somewhere where you do have that charitable number, but you're just looking to, you're thinking about a new way of creating that for your existing SEO. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Michelle. And I don't know about everyone else, but I, I did find your um, audio a little bit scrambled at the end there. So just to repeat that, uh, we just talked about the environmental, oh, sorry, the um, investment readiness continuum. And we talked about that early stage innovation. So yes, if you're unincorporated and you're still exploring a new idea, it may be too early, but if you are an existing charitable entity and you already have a charitable number or you're an existing social enterprise and you're looking at launching a new social enterprise, so you have a sort of track record and, um, and you have the in-house, some in-house expertise, then this would be a good uh, opportunity for you to explore that new potential business model. That's just repeating what Michelle says. And the other thing that um, Michelle stated is that the um, Gulf Islands are covered by the Vancouver Island 
um, consortium. And I do know that the Sunshine Coast is covered by Vancouver Foundation. Anything else to add, Michelle? Okay, nothing else from Michelle at this time. Can everyone hear my audio okay before we continue? Okay, I get a few solid yeses there. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and I assume if I go back to, I'm gonna leave Michelle unmuted. So um, feel free to pipe back up if there's anything you want to add, Michelle, but I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Perfect. So activities that are eligible for non-repayable capital, this is a non-exhausted list, but I found this list extremely helpful um, in understanding really what the IRP is intended for. So business planning, viability studies, accounting services, branding, brokerage, financial modeling, impact measurement, impact, investment structuring, pardon me, tendering and bid writing, legal services, product development, market analysis and understanding, financial recording, negotiation support, management coaching, minor asset purchase to fulfill a contract, minor renovation to fulfill a contract, or software and web development products. So if, if your organization or anyone you're speaking to, if you're more of an ecosystem partner, um, is still confused about whether or not this program for, is for them, I would really recommend reviewing this list, which is available in the guidelines, um, which I will link to, and um, starting here and saying like, are any of these things the things that would help me get investor ready? And if they are, then you can consider applying to um, the program for one of these services or supports or a bundle of them. Accessing service providers will be a really important part of this program. So um, there are a number of service providers, as I've mentioned, funded through the Government of Canada. Uh, there's five here, Lyft Philanthropy Partners, McConnell Foundation, Innoweave, Social Enterprise Ecosystem Project, Social Venture Connection, and Raven Indigenous Capital Partners. Um, more information is forthcoming about exactly what each of these partners can do for you. I've linked their website so you can visit and explore on your own. I do know a little bit about Innoweave and Raven, so I'll just briefly mention um, Innoweave is offering, as I mentioned previously, these social finance workshops and courses and coaching um, really to, I think, help people with the first and second call. Uh, Raven Indigenous Capital Partners is launching a national Indigenous sort of accelerator program. And so if you are an Indigenous entrepreneur and you want to be part of a national accelerator program, it would be, I think, a really good idea to get in touch with um, with Raven Capital and you can contact me for uh, contact information if you like I'm happy to put you in touch and then I also want to draw attention to our consortium partner at UBC has also um, a social innovation academy and, and this is a group of student analysts that are trained in social innovation and impact investing who can provide support to social purpose organizations so more information about all of this will be available um, in the future. There is someone who is writing on the screen and I'm not entirely sure how they're doing that, but it's quite amazing. Um, aside from these five organizations or six organizations, social purpose organizations are welcome to work with a reliable supplier of their choice. So that's really great. Like the flexibility of this program is fantastic. Um, if you have someone in your network, in your local community who can do this work with you, then that's, that's really great. We want to support um, the choice of SPOs. So um, Vancouver Foundation is also going to host more information about service providers on their website in January. I think it's really important that social pur um, purpose organizations bring their challenges to service providers and really consider shopping around for um, who can uh, provide you with the best service and also um, provide you with uh, sort of, I know when I'm shopping for a service, I like to talk to two or three people and get different quotes because uh, through that process, I learn so much more about the project I'm proposing and the potential way of, uh, of addressing um, that project. And so we do highly encourage applicants to consider contacting potential service providers while preparing their applications. Uh, and this will also help you get appropriate quotes for the work and enhance your submissions. 
A couple of resources and then we'll dive into questions. Um, these are all on the website, but there are quite extensive. Thank you to CFC for all of the wonderful information you've provided, program guidelines, FAQs, a glossary of terms. Um, the application form is different for charities as well as for non-qualified donees. So it is uh, good to make sure you're looking at the right application form. And then once again, if you're unsure about which regional partner you should be contacting for additional information and support, the CFC website has a list of all of the regional partners and specific liaisons. If you're within the Vancouver Foundation service area and have further questions about your application, uh, you can contact me. I will be your primary point of contact and my um, email at Vancouver Foundation and phone number is there. And if you experience technical difficulties with the application portal, CFC is generously providing a staff person explicitly for this purpose. Um, and Eren's uh, contact information is there. And again, once again, if you're at that exploring an idea stage, um, there are social finance workshops and courses and coaches available now from Innoweave. So that might be one place that you wanna go uh, in the very short term. So we're gonna turn it over to questions and discussion. I am going to stop sharing my screen, although, um, yeah, now I guess my contact information is not displayed, but you will get these uh, slides immediately after the session. So that should be available very soon. Um, and what I'm going to do is I will have to allow participants to unmute themselves. So I'm gonna turn that on now. So if you want can to- I, mm -hmm. Can I add in a little bit first? Sure, yes, Michelle, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to mention uh, two things. The first is that we are actually developing a map so that it might be a little bit easier to find out which region you're in, in terms of the regional partners. And then the second thing is that we have developed an IRP website that is kind of focused on the entirety of the program. So in that there will be a lot of resources available, including the expert service providers as well as other service providers and the successful applicants and once we have those. So it's irp-bi.ca and that's kind of the general IRP hub again so that's a full list of all of the different partners that the government has kind of uh, looked at alongside the regional partners. Thank you, Michelle. And um, so we will be coordinating with CFC to ensure that these processes are integrated and that the most up-to-date information is available on the Vancouver Foundation website. Um, Michelle, you are still having audio issues. So if you can type in the, um, that particular link that you just uh, mentioned to the, the chat box, that would be great. Um, I'm gonna just deal with some questions that have come in. There is one, um, well, I'll deal with the ones that have come publicly first. So is there a first come first serve benefit or are all applications reviewed after the February deadline? The latter, they will all be reviewed after the February deadline. From Brianne Miller, can applications include multiple activities or is the program limited to one? In my initial conversations with consortium partners, um, we have said, we have said that we do expect maybe complementary activities to come in um, in the applications, but Michelle, is there any other guidance you'd like to add to there, to that question? Yeah, so it's, as long as there's no overlap in the actual pro the project itself, um, and you can apply to different partners, again, we're gonna have a mechanism of making sure there's kind of no overlap in terms of what the project activities are. I'm not actually sure that I understand that, Michelle. So overlap and project activities, could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, so if you have, um, for example, you know that you wanna go move towards investment in a couple of years, and you know that alongside updating your business plan maybe, you also have to update some uh, financial information, you could apply for both projects. So they're both independent projects that are going to help you move along that continuum. And just to clarify, it would be one application that describes the two complementary activities. It, it could be either. 
Okay, so you can apply and have two separate applications? Yeah, if there was kind of two distinct pieces of the project and you saw it as two different things that would overall lead you to the, the, the same place, as long as there wasn't any ties in between. Okay, great. So you can either apply for two distinct projects or multiple very distinct projects or one kind of integrated and complementary project. Yes, and, and because you're still applying to the same regional partner, the idea would be that, you know, um, probably your application would be looked at favorably if there was one strong application versus two slightly weaker applications. Great. Okay, let's move on. There's seven new messages. So there's a question about the application. What does the application look like? Is there a checklist or template we can work with when we apply? Yes, absolutely. It is linked on the Vancouver Foundation website right now. Um, there's the application for qualified donees as well as non-qualified donees. So feel free to, to take a look. And as of today, the CFC application portal is also open. So you can actually start your application and, uh, and do it kind of live on the website, though we do recommend you, you sort of work offline to begin and then submit once you're complete. There's another question. You said that sole proprietorships are not eligible and that we need to be incorporated. What about partnerships? So Renee, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sure. We're, so we're, uh, I don't know, I forget what the legal term is. We are a uh, it's two people we're a partnership a business partnership and we are not incorporated michelle would you be able to help me out with that question yeah do you do you have a business license um, yes. yes you have a business yes. license you are registered with the cra i believe so I def yeah <laughs> i think so okay. I think you would be eligible then. Um, I, I kind of don't want to say for sure, but that sounds like it would be eligible if you have an HST number and- Yes, we do. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Tanya O is asking, could this program be used to hire staff? So um, as previously mentioned, it, the the information, the guidance given is that um, it can be used to hire dedicated staff capacity. And I think that's really to achieve a particular growth target. So it's not for ongoing staff purposes, but if you need to hire, um, actually there was a good example in the um, list of things that we, the list of activities. So, um, Tendering and bid writing, I kind of thought about, yeah, if you had someone who was going to join your team for a bit and be uh, responsible for tendering and bid writing as an example to scale up to meet demand, then I believe that would be eligible activity. Michelle, would you like to provide any further guidance on that question? I think you have it right. It would be hiring on a temporary basis, so a contract basis to help you fulfill the project. So hiring of contractors um, to fulfill the project. Yeah. Kylie Hutchison uh, is asking, is it compulsory that you work with one of the identified service providers? The answer is no, do not worry. Um, that would be a lot of responsibility for those five partners as well to serve the whole country. So uh, no, um, those are some recommended providers, but any, um, I'm trying to remember the exact word we used, but any, any kind of qualified, um, reliable supplier of your choice is, is totally fine. And then the next comment, Michelle's input the IRP-PPI.ca website. That's the general website that's being built out that will host lots more information um, in the future about different service providers. From Hillary Sampson, I'm a service provider creating business and feasibility plans for social enterprises, including indigenous organization. Is there a way to connect with applicants to discuss? So Hillary, this is why um, I think Michelle and I are both trying to figure out ways to make visible the service providers that are available um, in our regions. And so um, I will connect with you or you can email me at irp at vancouverfoundation.ca. Let's definitely figure out a way to make your contact information visible so that you can start getting in touch with those organizations right away. 
is there a funding from Polina Cameron? Is there a funding match? Is there a funding matching requirement from the organization for the fund ask being submitted? Michelle, I'm off the top of my head. I don't, I think no, but I cannot remember. Can you confirm that for me? There's no matching required. Great. Kim North, are the funds reliant on applicant financial and in-kind contributions? Michelle? Um, again, that would be a part of the kind of regional decision making model. So um, I think a strength of an application um, would be stronger if you do have some sort of in kind contribution. Um, it doesn't have to be financial. Um, but, but I think in terms of just evaluating the applications that come in, it would probably be stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the you know, the guidance is that the organization has to demonstrate you have a plan, the capacity and expertise to carry out the proposed project. If you have, you know, the in-house expertise to manage a contractor um, and, and, you know, that in-house expertise is going to be matching the work of the contractor, then that, you know, something like that might be important to demonstrate uh, in your application, but it is not required. Exactly. This is a bit of a long one. One moment from Kristen. Wondering about expert service providers and how they specifically come into the equation. We're considering applying to the IRP for support. Capital development project. Um, all right, costs associated with pre-development, environmental assessments, quality surveyors, functional programming, et cetera. We have source quotes, which do not necessarily align with the expert service provider. Yes, so the list that we provided, um, which already had sort of like 16 categories is, uh, is non exhaustive. So um, there could be additional um, services that would support um, uh, that would be eligible for this program. So um, don't consider that list exhaustive. And at first blush, I think if you are looking to access social finance in, in the very short period of time, then um, and I think we should have a further conversation about, about your project, Kristen. It sounds eligible to me, I would say. Michelle, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, exactly. If, if the services you need are very specific and a very professional um, kind of level, like a nutritionist or environmental assessments, that's absolutely eligible. And we don't expect it. We don't expect that you're going to be able to find that from the same people who are doing business plans, for example. Yes. From Sarah, in the application info, I noticed that five years of past financial statements are required. What should new organizations do to fulfill this requirement? So um, as I mentioned, you do not have to be generating revenue already. You can have a plan to generate revenue. We would like to support organizations across the spectrum of investment readiness. So um, I believe, uh, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you would leave these empty. And I, I, I thought there was maybe some guidance about that in the form, but Michelle, maybe you can add add to that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you, so you would put in the financial information that you do have. If you haven't been around for five years, two years, or one year, whatever you can. So just to repeat back what Michelle said, um, provide whatever financial information you can, and um, you do not have to have five years of financial information. From Polina Cameron, I think this is in response to our earlier um, conversation about multiple applications. Um, can they each be for 100k total or is max is, uh, sorry, in to mm, sorry, or total for both is max 100,000. So um, if you were applying for two separate projects, I don't imagine, I mean, I don't think there's anything preventing us from funding two separate projects from the same organization, but in some ways I kind of can't imagine that happening. So um, I don't see why they both couldn't be 100 K each, but Michelle, perhaps you could. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with your, your analysis there. It, it would really be at your discretion if, um, if you chose to, um, to pick two projects from the same SPO um, for 100K, that would be up to kind of the Vancouver Foundation Museum. Um, maybe not. Is there a timeline by which projects need to be completed? Yes, I believe there is. 
Michelle, um, I believe I learned this from you a couple of weeks back, but can you remind me, is it December? Um, so at the moment, we don't have a finalized date of when projects need to be completed. Uh, we have to absolutely have all projects done for the end of the program itself, which is March 2021. Mm -hmm. um, we are definitely suggesting that you make it a shorter project rather than a longer project, just so um, if it's possible, a lot of these we are imagining are going to take three months perhaps up to six months. Uh, but yeah, so the final kind of end date where all the projects need to be done is March 2021. I don't want to make things, you know, more complicated than they need to be, but I think this gives us some indication of for the length of projects. So for, um, for non-qualified donees, one of the um, ways in which we will have to work in order to comply with different regulation is to provide, if, if an ask is over 30K, um, the non-qualified donee will receive it in two allotments. And so, and they will have to, after three months, demonstrate some, some traction towards the outcomes and deliverables of that project. So um, if that gives you any sense, you know, you should have completed a significant part of the project within three months of starting it. I think that would be a good touch point or a good reference point. Do you agree with that, Michelle? Yeah. Okay. Um, from half year. Okay, so I'm just noting that it is 1121 and there are 19 new messages. So I think what we'll do is just go in order for the next nine minutes and answer as many questions as we can. And then we'll wrap up at 1130 and I can stay an extra 10 or 15 minutes to answer additional questions. Um, uh, for if there are if there are more there. So Javier, if you have a charitable number, not for profit, thinking of running an income generation activity, do you need to register that activity under a different social business number or can you apply with your nonprofit number? Yes, I had this question too. I think that um, you should apply with your with your nonprofit number. Is that true, Michelle? Yeah. Okay. That, I think we should, yeah, let's we'll clarify that on the website as well. <laughs> um, Mel has two questions, but then Risa snuck in. So I'm just going to answer Risa's question first. Can projects occur in more than one region? So actually, Risa, can you clarify what you mean by that? If you're able to unmute yourself. Okay, maybe we'll hear from Risa, but I'll just kind of- Okay, I unmuted. It. Can you hear me now? Can, yep, yeah, absolutely, thanks. So uh, we're um, the Salish Sea Renewable Energy Co-op, and we have members in on the Sunshine Coast, as well as the Gulf Islands, as well as Bowen, which might be in the Vancouver uh, region. So what if our project occurs across your regions? So I- I would be applying to the regional partner um, in which you are based, in which your offices are, are sort of headquartered or based, even if your, your project is occurring across, across regions. Michelle, would you agree with that? Yes, um, or alternatively, it could be the community, so the region where you kind of have the strongest community ties. For example, if your project has been up and running for a lot longer in one of those regions, you might feel a bit stronger uh, connection to a specific community. But so if it's, question, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry, so is that, is that acceptable or should it, would it be best to just do it in one region? Because that's like your governance structure is regionally based. So I see that as a bit of a challenge for you guys. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you might uh, get in touch with us directly and we can actually have a little bit of a conversation between if you're based across, for example, like the Vancouver Foundation IRP and the Vancouver Island IRP, we could, the three of us kind of have a chat about which would be best to apply to um, okay. in a specific case. But um, I think that either of the responses Michelle and I gave 
work and I would encourage applicants to use their discretion. Um, so either the region that they're sort of headquartered in or if they have really, really strong presence in a particular region and, you know, that region really wants them to apply type thing, then, you know, it may make sense to do it that way. Okay, thank you. Okay, to Mel's questions. Uh, to attach the application, should a slide deck be attached and how many slides or a business plan is it capped at 10 pages? Uh, Michelle, can I ask you to answer that one? Yeah, we actually don't have a business plan as an attachment anymore. Um, some previous versions had asked for one, but that's set out now. So we have a preference that you answer some questions in the application form itself, some kind of directed questions, rather than giving um, a business plan as an attachment. So there definitely is kind of a preference that you answer questions in the application form rather than supplementing with attachments. Okay. Uh, can this program be used to produce a theater production, um, sharing cultural and historical content? Uh, I would say there's certainly a cultural, um, social impact to that, um, you know, model. If, if you plan to generate revenue, and this is an enterprising activity, it may be eligible, but if you'd like to contact us, Sarah, we can talk a little bit more um, about your project idea. Kiri. Yes, Mel. Sorry. Hi. Uh, hi, I've unmuted myself. Um, so is that pitch deck and a business plan? So neither are required now? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being so good about muting and unmuting yourselves and patient with this process. It's really great. There's lots of fantastic questions coming forward. Uh, can you comment on the distinction between applying to increase capacity to raise charitable funds to produce a service versus generating product service specific revenue and what is slash is not eligible? Um, I've seen both of these yeah, examples given in IRP discussions to date as eligible activities. Um, Michelle, do you have further guidance to give on that? Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, wrap my head around the difference here. Sorry, bear with me for a moment. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess the um, the distinction here is that you're generating revenue from the sale of a goods or a service rather than um, generating revenue through, for example, fundraising. So one would be eligible in that you're generating revenue from an actual program, a good or a service, and the other of fundraising would not be eligible. Yeah, it's uh, Andrew here. So uh, we provide an information platform that is um, driven by sponsors, uh, but we're thinking about expanding that to a freemium model with a registration mm -hmm. and um, a subscription program. So uh, right now we rely solely on just charitable funds that go towards the platform. And we don't know if we're going to be able to charge for a premium uh, member. Okay, um, but you're still generating revenue, but what you're actually selling in this situation would be you know, your ad space. We have no ad space. We're not generating any, any direct revenue. We're only by donation. Oh, okay, I see. But your plan is to then have a subscription service down the road. That's what we'd like to explore, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that would fall into the category of exploring um, the feasibility of a new revenue stream. Um, so I would, we could have a, a longer conversation about that, Andrew, but I think if, if, if it's exploring a new revenue stream and the feasibility of that, then that would be an eligible activity. Okay, thanks. Appreciate your help. All right, it's 11.25, uh, 29, sorry, last question. Well, I mean, I can stay longer, but I, I might encourage people to go after this last question. Um, so if not approved for requested amount of funding, will there be opportunity to discuss and adjust uh, requested level of funding? So there, there will be a second call. Um, and I will, I haven't seen, an official statement, Michelle, on whether there will be fun, uh, feedback on, um, on applications. I think to some degree, 
Michelle, do you want to comment on that first before I continue my comment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I actually don't really want to answer that on your behalf because it would be um, kind of what level you are willing to, to do. We're definitely going to have multiple rounds. So there's going to be at least two rounds. So potentially you could uh, reach out to some of those people and ask them if they want to be uh, included in the next round as well. But, but I don't want to give exactly how much feedback you would be providing. Yeah, I don't think we can commit to that at this time. Um, just because this is such a new program, we really don't know what the demand is going to be. Are we going to get 50 applications or 500, right? So um, we can't commit to that at this time, but uh, I would say follow up after the, um, the decisions have been communicated. And, and at that time, we'll definitely you know, let you know about, about some follow on feedback. Okay, Mel's second question did not get answered, it's, or yet. It's 11.30. I hope that the information has been informative for many of you. Um, I think what we might do is, I will stay, I can stay till about 11.45 uh, and continue to answer questions. Um, so maybe I'm just gonna skip down to the bottom and see what people are saying. Thank you, thank you. Um, Okay, it seems like, the, my only concern is if I keep answering questions and then the people aren't here. <laughs> so maybe what we'll do is um, thank people for their time. And yeah, I'll, try, I'll maybe just try to answer a few more questions that I think have broad relevance. And if not, we'll uh, exit the, we'll, we'll, we'll download the chat and, and as well as the webinar and provide this for people. So, Thanks so much for everyone who has to leave. I really appreciate your participation. And Michelle, will you be, can you stay on for maybe 10 or 15 more minutes? Yeah, I can stay on for another 10 minutes, but then I uh, have to run, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, I mean, I mean, I do too. So we'll stay until 11.40 and do as many questions as we can before 11.40. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. If you have to go, have a great day. Okay, back to question number two from Mel. How much emphasis is put on the list of social impact activities? Um, I would say a significant amount. Um, there's lots of financing opportunities out there that are not for social impact. Um, so we certainly want to um, emphasize through the RRP program the, um, the, that the impact will grow through this activity. So I can't give you an exact weighting, but it will be significant. Is there an evaluation framework available for the application? Sorry, Sorry I know we're on the timeline here, Kiri. Um, I saw a list somewhere, I think it was originally gotten from like the UN or something like that, that had like a list of like environment, human rights and these kind of things. So my question was more like, I can't find it right now, but is it like, I think numbers three was environment. Is there a preference or priority weighting on various issues, social issues within that list? I believe those are the UN Sustainable Development Goals yes. listed, and then people select which ones they apply to. Uh, my assumption is that is just for impact tracking, and there's no preference. Uh, Michelle, do you? Yeah, exactly. It, it's just for kind of our information purposes and for us to kind of track our own impact. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. No problem. Is the evaluation framework available for the application? Um, not at this time. Michelle, will one be made available or no? At the moment, we just kind of have some, some rough headings. We're hoping to build that out a little bit more, but we're not going to be actually providing a framework for that evaluation in its entirety. So just the guidance that's being provided in these webinars and on the website then in the guidelines, um, that is what you will have to produce the application. Is a social enterprise a type of legal entity or can a regular incorporated business with social impact goals be classified as a social enterprise? Yes, Lisa, it can be. Um, you do, uh, the only, I mean, they, this is longer. <laughs> the community contribution company is, um, is an attempt in, in British Columbia to sort of classify a social enterprise, but a social, a regular business with impact goals is eligible for this program. When the project needs to be completed by March 2021, does it mean you have to show proof that we have generated that revenue we mentioned we would generate in the application or would it be only sufficient to show that the contractor has completed his or her work, his or her their work? Um, Michelle, do you have any um, guidance on reporting? I haven't seen the templates yet. Yeah, so the reporting would be um, how far you have moved along the kind of that spectrum we spoke of. Mm -hmm. and 
And if your goal was at the end, you would be ready for investment. We would hope to see that, but maybe your goal was simply to do a specific project and we are just looking for that project. Does that clarify a bit? I'm not sure if Tanya is still on. Let's do a quick search in the chat. I do see her on. Hopefully that's informative. Tanya, do you have anything else you want to add to that question? So I'm, I'm not hearing that there's any request for proof of renovate, revenue generated in the final reporting template. From Christy, we operate three social enterprises. Our purpose is providing employment training for people with barriers. Are we able to uh, scale? Are we able to scale by adding additional managers to each enterprise? If it is, um, if you're trying to add an ongoing staff salary cost, I believe the answer is no. Um, I'm afraid that's a no. Yeah, that's a no, sorry. Uh, from Wildsight, would we be able to apply for both rounds, complete one activity in the first round and another activity in the second round? I believe the answer is yes to that question, Michelle. If someone is moving from, let's say, like stage two to stage three in round one and then, well, but you may not, I guess you would have to probably complete the activities pretty quickly to turn it around. Um, but I don't think there's anything restricting the same organization for applying to move another step along the continuum by the end of the program. There's no restrictions there. Um, Michelle, is that true? Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think it's um, maybe not going to be the norm, but it would be possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, very helpful. Helpful, great, excellent. <laughs> is expanding into another market, for example, the US eligible for the project? So the work has to be done in Canada. So um, if you're trying to expand to another market in Canada, I would say that's eligible activity, but not in the US, Brianne. Michelle, is that what you would understand? Yeah, the, the impact needs to be in Canada. Fantastic. Um, excellent, okay, I've got, I think one very specific private chat message. So I will deal with that one separately. Uh, in the whole chat box, I am going to just type my general email, which is irp at vancouverfoundation.ca. Um, feel free to email me and I will send the webinar slides out to everyone um, right away so that we everyone has this content and all the links and it's 1137 I think we'll wrap here but thank you so much Michelle for being part of the conversation and for all these fantastic questions um, I've learned a lot I hope you did too and have a good day thank you